to Let's Unpack That, a podcast where two eh, somewhat adultyish people uh, read books that they read when they were children and reanalyze them from a sociopolitical and literary perspective as hardened adults. I'm Nina. I'm Lydia. And we have forgotten completely how to do the podcast. We've been trying to start this podcast for the past five minutes, and none of it was working. So bear with us here. Uh, I was also in the middle of telling Lydia that my biggest problem, it would seem, that it comes to recording podcasts is that I cannot sit still, which is why my audio is always shit. So today's challenge is to stay as still as possible, and hopefully, hopefully, my audio will be okay. Anyway, this episode, we read chapters three and four of The Hunger Games, and that was after... Katniss has volunteered as a tribute in the 74th Hunger Games in place of her little sister Prim. We're starting with chapter three. So to summarize that, uh, also side note, my audio is shit because I record in a near empty room. Uh, Chapter three, Mm. (laughs) Katniss has her last meetings with her family and a bunch of other people who come to see her for some reason, like the baker and Madge and Gail. Gail makes sense. Uh, But she's afraid that her mother will fall back into a depression and not take care of Prim uh, like she did when their dad died. The baker comes in, who's, you know, Peta's dad, uh, and he gives her some cookies and promises to keep an eye on Prim and make sure she's fed. Madge comes in, who's the mayor's daughter, And uh, she gives Katniss the Mockingjay pin that they had seen earlier when they delivered strawberries to the mayor's house. Gail comes in to give advice and to say goodbye, but he has to leave before he can tell Katniss a big secret that he wants her to know. And we're left wondering. The one thing she must remember. Yes. God only knows. What must she remember? It's too late now. Who knows? The door has been slammed. Goodbye. Is it that he loves her? We'll never know. I don't know. Sound The story's pretty convincing from there, but... Well, this is where the shipping starts. Woo-hoo. But anyway, then Katniss and Peeta get on the train to the capital. Uh, we learn about the Mockingjays and why it means so much that she has the pin. They eat dinner while watching the other reapings go on in the other districts. And they meet their advisor, Haymitch, who is an alcoholic and collapses in his own vomit. After drinking profusely. Can't imagine why. He's only had to watch however many decades of children be slaughtered in front of his very eyes while he tried somewhat to save them. We don't learn a lot about Haymitch in this book, um, but I believe as the books go on, we really see more of his story develop. And actually, Haymitch is one of my favorite characters, oddly enough. Um, I think he's very dynamic and very interesting. And I, I don't know. I like him. I don't know why. Well, we just start to meet him here, and uh, Katniss does not like him, and he is not making himself very likable right now. That's chapter three, so uh, let's start. I think you wrote down a quote from Mockingjay Part 1, the movie, which indicates to me that you watched it in the last 24 hours uh, since you added this note. Yes, I added this note about uh, two hours ago, actually. It was actually from Mockingjay Part 1, which I watched last weekend. In the past two weeks, I have binged all four of the movies, and I finished with Mockingjay Part 2 last night, actually, which I really like because it has given me a whole new perspective on the narrative to play out in a way that is sometimes a little bit hard to visualize in the book. You see a little bit more of the actual setup of the whole system and the politics, the politics, the politics behind everything. The one quote that I really wanted to touch on, because we were really constructing how the districts and the capital work together, this quote stood out to me as a very good, I would say, metaphor for how the districts work. Um, This is how President Snow describes the capital and its relationship to the districts in the movie. If you haven't read the events of Catching Fire, essentially what happens is that Katniss destroys the arena and escapes with a few of her fellow tributes and thus starts the whole second rebellion. Um, And so Mockingjay Part 1 picks up right after that's happened. And President Snow is addressing the entire nation of Pan Am. They say Pan Am really weird in the movie, by the way. I don't know why. It's like Pan Am? I don't know. Probably because nobody really knows how to pronounce it. It's just one of those words. Pan Am. 
Uh, also, what is the capital accent? It's referenced so many times, but I don't well, know if anybody has a really clear idea of what that accent is or why. Effie Trinket, I think, is demonstrated to be like the most capital of capital persons. And she almost speaks in a half British accent. Prince yeah, it's like a cross between Everdeen. British and Valley Girl. May the odds be ever in your favor. So it's like. But it's, it's not consistent. Like Caesar right. Flickerman says it differently. Yes. It's like, and he's like, welcome to the Hunger Games. And I think it's supposed to be more consistent uh, in the books than it actually turns out to be in the movies. I don't know if they yeah. really played on it as much in the movies, but the the idea, I think it's supposed to be very lithy and very kind of dramatic the way I think yeah. Effie Trinket plays that role. What's her? Elizabeth Banks. Elizabeth Banks. The way Elizabeth Banks plays that character, I think she does a phenomenal job, first of all. Like, wow. Uh, and I think that she really plays into the capital accent in a way that the other characters don't. Circling all the way back, yeah. speaking of the capital. All the way. <laughs> <laughs> Opening of Mockingjay Part 1, President Snow is addressing Pan Am and saying, hey, by the way, these vigilantes are out there. Don't listen to them. They're not cool. And President Snow says, those who choose this destructive path, your actions are based on a mis misunderstanding of how we have survived together. It is a contract. Each district supplies the capital like blood to a heart. In return, the capital provides order and security. To refuse work is to put the entire system in danger. The capital is the beating heart of Pan Am. Nothing can survive without a heart. That pretty succinctly summarizes the fact that the districts give all that they have to the capital. The way that President Snow tries to play it off is that it's a symbiotic relationship. It's an equal contract where the capital provides order and security. But from what? The only thing they're really protecting the districts from is the capital themselves. They're protecting them from one another. They're isolating them. It's always been a vague threat and it's al always been about the capital because while a body can't survive without a heart, you can't survive without kidneys either. Yes, and they this metaphor doesn't work very well in that respect because within an organism, you have so many cooperating systems that are working together. Mm -hmm. And they're all the equally important. Right. I, I really liked that this was kind of how the districts were being portrayed to one another as like, oh, we all support the capital and so capital supports us. Yay. But really, that's it's not really how that works. It's more like the capital is a parasite that is pulling from the body, which is the district, saying that, oh, I'm protecting you by mm -hmm. sucking this from you. I'm making sure that nothing else can hurt you. But the thing that's really like hurting if the it. heart were only working one way to pull blood away from everything instead of right. pumping it back out. It is a leech. Ew. <laughs> I know. Anyway, I wanted to share that because I thought in terms of how we were breaking down the districts in our last episode. Yeah, it's pretty relevant to how we were discussing the capital and the districts last episode. These chapters, we see less of the district itself and more of the transition into the capital. And so we're kind of in an in-between space here. We're not in the districts, but we're not in the capital either. But we're experiencing the luxury of the capital in the train. We see a lot of the of this time how Katniss is kind of in between. And I think that comes through in the writing, how it, it's a little bit... Almost like a no man's land. Yeah, but the, the writing itself is the way that it's narrated is like choppy. A little bit, especially I thought in this chapter three, where we have a series of meetings with different people and each of those meetings is important, but they're also very isolated incidents. So I wanted to talk about mm. each one individually because each one individually does matter, starting with the meeting that Katniss has with her mom and Prim who come in and are allowed a certain amount of time to say goodbye to her um, and basically say, don't die. But if you do, goodbye. Does it mention whether or not family members get a longer amount of time or does everyone get kind of the same amount of time? In the movie, while you're looking that up, in the movie, it seems very quick. It's like, bum, 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 bum. Everyone's gone. But I thought in chapter three, she says it's like an hour. So in, an hour is the entire time allotted for tributes to say goodbye to their loved ones. Oh. So everybody has to fit in that hour. Wow. 
And how do they divide it up in the movie, in the book? I don't know. It seems like each of them gets a minute because it, it just feels so quick. And this is going back to what I said about it being kind of choppy. Um, it feels like they get a very short amount of time. Like if Gale had 15 minutes, he wouldn't wait until he was literally being dragged out at the end of that 15th minute to tell her something important. That just doesn't make sense. Right. It has to be something like five minutes and maybe more time for the more important people like the immediate family. Yeah. But it doesn't, it doesn't feel like long, which I think but is then also, intentional. When you're writing a scene like this, like the time it takes to flesh this out feels much longer than how it reads. When she was in the middle of writing this, I am sure that it felt like a longer amount of time because when you're in the middle of penning it out and trying to flesh out this scene, I mean, this was always something that I experienced when I was writing a lot of short stories was I would write out a whole scene and it would take forever. And I would think, oh, this is great. And then I reread it and it just went by so fast. Maybe it's just the perceived time of putting it out there and then how fast it takes to read it. I think that could be part of it. But another literary tidbit for everybody to take with them today is uh, the difference between scene and summary. I don't know if I've talked about this when we were reading Twilight, but uh, scene is really when you're in the scenario and it's describing like every line of dialogue, every movement, as opposed to a summary where you don't have direct dialogue. You're just summarizing a conversation. You're just saying this is generally what we did. And I, now that I'm really reading more closely, I see that the first part of the bit where her mom and her and Prim come into the room, a lot of that is summary, which could indicate that more time has passed that we're not seeing because we're not seeing everything that she's saying to them. But this one is still more fleshed out than the other ones. Mm -hmm. Which which definitely indicates that it's a longer amount of time. But that explains why it doesn't seem to fill the entire hour. It feels like the, the interaction between Prim, Katniss, and their mother is less of a summary, in my opinion, and more of a scene because we have more active dialogue between the two. I feel like with Madge and the Baker and Gail, we still have more of the summary, you know, if you had to rate them. I'm actually going to disagree with you here. I think the first part of this encounter with the mom and Prim is summary. Um, she says, then I start telling them all the things they must remember to do now that I will not be there to do them for them. And that's a clear indication of summary. We're summarizing what she's saying to them as opposed to having direct dialogue. Whereas in the other little segments with the other people, we have Madge walks in, Madge gives me this thing, Madge says this, and then she leaves. Um, and there's no, we talk about this and this apart from what dialogue is actually there. Does the difference make sense? No, it definitely does. And I wasn't thinking about the summary part of the first part of this chapter. Um, I kind of pushed that aside and was thinking just more of the dialogue because it seemed like there was just more dialogue in that part. But now that I'm reading that, I, I do see what you mean. It does feel more like a summary. So maybe they were there for, I don't know, 45 minutes and then they had 15 minutes to, you know, do everything else. Because mm -hmm. that, that part is, it's not just summary, it's also not just scene like the other parts. I am on the same page now. Okay, cool. <laughs> now for what I actually wanted to talk about in this, uh, because I did not write any notes on scene and summary, but here we are. I wanted to talk about depression. Um, yeah! So last time we talked a bit about poverty and psychological distress and uh, not being able to afford to be actively in psychological distress when you're just trying to survive. And I also wanted to compare this little bit to Twilight a little bit because there's an acknowledgement of the mom's depression as an illness that she could have treated with medicine if she had the resources to do so. Compared to the flippancy in Twilight, which we talked about when that came up of like just as a random and not seriously considered thing, this is acknowledged as an actual illness. Right. And even though it's not an affordable illness for most of the people in this situation, it's an actual thing. 
that is acknowledged. And that kind of surprised me. It's more, I think it's more acknowledged by the reader than it is by Katniss. I think Katniss, because she holds a lot of resentment for her mom, recognizes that it's an illness, but she still kind of sees it as an inherent weakness. Whereas we as the reader, for whatever reason, we, we see it as like, okay, she was sick. But Katniss calls it an illness, but the way that she behaves around her mother also makes it seem like she thinks it was partly a choice. I think we're meant to know that it's an illness, but Katniss, she can't convince herself that that's, ca that's the case. She can't forgive yeah. her mom. Yeah, and that definitely shows a, a bit of where Katniss is with her own emotions, with refusing to feel anything. The mom is very clear about it. She says, I was ill. I could have treated myself if I'd had the medicine I have now. Next, Katniss says Prozac. that part about her being ill might be true. Perhaps it's at sickness, but it's one we can't afford. So she knows rationally that, yes, it's an illness. And her mother knows rationally that it is an illness, but she's also struggling with, well, you do what you have to do no matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what you feel because she's so used to putting her own feelings by the wayside. Right. She's kind of like, we don't have time for this. Like, I don't have time to be depressed. I don't have time to be worried. I don't have time to have a fit or to cry or do anything because if I do, then it'll just get worse. I wish I could tell myself I don't have time to be depressed. Imagine all the stuff I'd accomplish. Yeah, but imagine <laughs> also all the therapy you'd need to undo that bit and allow yourself to feel again. It's fine. Lesser of two evils. Do you choose between feeling stuff and feeling sad or not feeling stuff and not feeling anything about anything? There has to be a middle ground somewhere. There are productive people in this world who aren't depressed. There are productive people in this world who are depressed. The secret is therapy and medication. Me out? No, I'm, I'm calling myself out. Right <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell myself at least once a week, get your ass in gear. Hey, and thus my entire college experience summarized in a nutshell. Hey, cheerful things. Let's talk about the big symbolic moment of this whole entire book. Da, 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 da. Yes. Because Katniss has friends. Katniss has friends. But even more important, she got this, like, super cute pin. And she, like, kept it with her. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, my and God. I, really I got this from this. the mayor's daughter. It's super chic. It's um, chic. I'm going to hold it up to the camera right now. Put my hand behind it. You can see yes, it's an enameled gold. Yes, honey. <laughs> it's nice. And it's sort of a more brassy color, which gives it a more uh, pop. And there's a bird I'm, on it. I apologize in advance for that plosive, Dylan. I am channeling my inner Jonathan Van Ness. Oh, see, I oh, was hell. channeling my beauty guru. Oh. <laughs> in any case, here's what happens. Madge comes in. And again, she's the daughter of the mayor. Very wealthy. Has never had to put her name in extra times for Tesserae. Is always clean, well fed, uh, and the closest thing that Katniss has had a friend has had to a friend other than Gail. But she didn't know that they were friends. She didn't know that, and is very surprised when Madge walks in. But she's even more surprised when Madge comes in and gives her the pin that she had been wearing. Um, that was the Mockingjay pin. And actually, later on in the series, you find out that, that pin belonged to Madge's aunt, who died in the 50th Hunger Games and was the other tribute along with Haymitch. Oh. Yeah. Crazy. So that pin originally belonged to, I think her name was Maisley, and she died in the 50th Hunger Games. And now this pin is being passed on. She left the pin to her niece, Madge, and then Madge grew up. Now she is giving it to Katniss. Uh, and I really want to talk about this for a minute because I remember this distinctly uh, from the movie. If you remember in the movie... <sighs> Katniss picks out this pin from like a little pile of buttons in the hob and it looks mm -hmm. like this little cheap pin and she gives it to Prim as a this will keep you safe and then Prim gives it back to her in the movie which is like oh cute symbolism you know it's gonna protect stop 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 I remember the temperature in the room physically changed in the movie theater <laughs> when Katniss pulled out the pin and was like oh what's this I remember there were people around me who just like, oh, and shuffled. Like, you know, when you can just feel the entire audience reacting to something on screen. This was one of those moments and it was not a positive reaction. Everyone was like, are you kidding me right now? 
what? And I had that same reaction. I actually forgot about that change until I rewatched the movie a couple weeks ago. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They just completely wiped out a very, very important part of the book. You know, again, we've been talking, we talked at length until we were blue in the face about how there is not only the separation between districts, but the separation between the wealthy and the poor inside the districts. There is a poverty line that is very thick and very prominently felt. This moment of Madge, who is on the wealthy side of that fence, giving this pin to Katniss, who is very poor, is so huge in so many ways. And the movie just fucking destroyed it and shat on it and buried it alive and then dug it up again and strangled it and beat it and then buried it again. (sighs) I'm very mad about it. Yes, I can tell. (laughs) And here's why, you know, not only does that pin symbolize the connection that Madge has with Katniss, but it demonstrates a small sliver of a bridge between the poverty gap within the District 12. It is the little bit of glue that holds this symbolic mosaic together, this breach of class that we don't really see demonstrated anywhere else. You know, we see Gail and Katniss will go and sell their hunting wares to the, the wealthy, you know, like they'll sell their kills to the, the baker and the mayor. But it's always a backdoor deal. You know, it's always like this. It's not as if I'll come in and have something to eat and welcome. And, oh, you brought us this. Thank you so much. Here's what I'll give you. No, it's always like, a well, I caught this. Here, let me lean out. Let me knock on your back door. And we can secretly and covertly make this exchange. And I'm never a welcome guest in your house. I'm never a guest at your table. Ah! And so the fact that Madge is giving this pin to Katniss is like, it is so huge. And I don't even think people realized it. And certainly the filmmakers didn't realize it because they completely skipped over that part. I mean, obviously what's done is done. I don't want to say I'm looking too much into this, but still, it's it's a huge moment. It not only establishes a friendship between Katniss and Madge, but it's that small spark of we're in this together. You are coming from my district. You are representing me and I'm with you. It's complete and utter crap (laughs) that the movie skipped out on this and everyone had a problem with it in the movie theater. I will say it here once and one time only. Madge is the one who truly started the rebellion. Okay, see, I'm going to be more lenient with the filmmakers because I've heard a lot and watched a lot of interviews about book to movie adaptations and what is possible and what isn't possible. And one of the things I noticed because I watched the Hunger Games movie last week, they eliminated the class distinction in District 12. They did away with that whole distinction. There are those in the district who have sort of enough, like the Baker's family, but you'd never see anyone who is above the poverty line. You never see Mm. anyone wealthy who is from the district. And I think that was probably for the sake of, you know, convenience. See, because the district is a character in itself. And if you split that district into two, then you have two characters instead of one. And it would be easier to just have the district as one cohesive entity than it is to portray the different classes within that district in such a short amount of time that Katniss is in the district. So I think that was why they did it for the movie, was to really just unify the district as one solid entity where everybody's Mm -hmm. poor because that's easier to portray and easier to get the message of unity across but there wasn't unity but there was like well but 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 in the book not really like there was the seam and the people who are putting in their names however many times and then the people who are not and think of it as uh, a miniature conflict and you can't have a conflict resolve itself in the first 10 minutes of the movie because then it's just a throwaway conflict and it's like what was even the point in the book it makes sense but in the movie to have oh there's this huge class division and then suddenly they're all unified in the first 10 minutes of the movie when they all refuse to clap that's the unification of the district but to portray that division and unification in just 10 minutes of film is not very cohesive and doesn't bode well for the overall arc it isn't as powerful well and i'm just gonna keep i'm gonna keep on keeping on because you know when i'm thinking about obviously because i am a master of all things filmography and 
directiveness. Yeah. I think it would have been interesting to see that gap set up in the beginning of the movie. You know, we have the people who are wearing the poor clothes and the distinctions like that. And then seeing the people who are clearly healthier and wearing more expensive clothing and having that dividing. And then when it comes time for the reaping, all of those children coming together and be mi being mixed in because it doesn't resolve that unity, but it shows that they are divided every other day of the year, but then they're forced to come together on this reaping. And that forced unity on this day is what keeps them powerless in a way. I, I, I think it would have been extremely prominent and poignant to have the two sides developed in the in the movie but it's definitely <sighs> possible and i'm pretty sure i've seen it i went through a whole phase of watching fan films of people who actually made their own hunger games films on youtube um, and found some really good ones but i think you think that's easier to portray in a visual medium than it actually is because like what are you going to have half of the kids of the district in capital clothing like how are you going to Not capital make clothing, that distinction clear when the color palette of the district is so clearly defined through katniss's eyes because we don't see a lot of the wealthy part of the district because katniss doesn't belong there <sighs> Well, if we're not going to solve this uh, impasse in one night, we can continue debate it, to debate it on a later date. Long story short, Katniss gets the pin, and it's a Mockingjay pin. We haven't learned the meaning of the Mockingjay yet, but I think we do in this chapter. We learn that it's a mixture of uh, a Mockingbird and a Jabberjay, which were genetically created by the capital that were sent to spy on the rebels and basically record their conversations and repeat them back to the capital people. And then when this rebellion war was over, the Jabberjays were set free and they bred with Mockingbirds to create Mockingjays. So the Mockingjays are both a product of nature, but they're also inextricably mixed with the capital's influence. I thought that this was, aside from the Mockingjay just being a general symbol of rebellion and a reminder that there was a big rebellion, um, I think it was quite symbolic of the people of the districts uh, because the capital has basically engineered quote unquote, generations of individuals to fear or to aspire to the Hunger Games. And it doesn't make them inhuman, but it also, it's like a combination of nature and nurture it just makes them something different. Maybe I'm right. being too dramatic. <laughs> no, you're actually not. And there's a great scene that was actually deleted from Catching Fire where President Snow is talking about how the mistake of the Mockingjays was that they didn't kill off all of the Jabber Jays instead, instead of letting them go and letting them be free and how that's changed their fundamental DNA throughout time. And that's very similar to how the districts have changed over time, how they were allowed to live, but now they are different. Some of them are engineered differently. There are different attributes to it. So no, it's actually very, I think that's completely correct. And we're going to see more of the mocking Jays and the other capital engineered creatures later is an interesting aspect of the technology of this dystopia but we'll get to that later want to talk about killing people let's talk about killing people all right i've never killed a person Ooh, neither have i i don't want to kill people i would prefer not to so you would if you had to i mean i think anyone would if they had to isn't this what this whole book is about yeah what did you find uh, out so i really narrowed in on the thing that Gail said when he was in the Justice Building with Katniss, he says that killing people is just like killing animals. And Katniss replies, the awful thing is that if I can forget their people, it will be no different at all. Basically, if you can rationalize the killing in your head that it's just another animal, it's just another creature, and it doesn't right, matter a that it's a person, that you just do your duty and go with it. She also says later, a kind PETA malarch is far more dangerous than an unkind one, meaning that mm -hmm. it's easier to kill the people that you don't like, and it's harder to kill the people that you do like, and it's harder to kill people that you know are good than those that you know are bad. Or do you at least believe to be bad? Right. Yeah. 
Um, and it's all about personal belief. Who can say what is good or bad? That depends who you ask. Hmm? It's a very individual thing. So I did a bit of research on this, and according to a 2015 study by Dr. Molenbergs, uh, the director of the Monash Social Neuroscience Lab at Monash University in Australia, in a simulated environment, killing triggered responses from the lateral orbitofrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain involved in moral decision making. Uh, it's right above your eye socket, like right behind your brow bone. And so the study measured brain activity while people played violent video games, and the orbitofrontal cortex had higher activity when they were quote-unquote killing innocent civilians than th when they were killing enemy soldiers in the game. Basically that guilt is a specific and measurable brain activity and justified versus unjustified violence changes the amount of guilt that the orbitofrontal cortex responds with. So throughout this whole thing I was trying to figure out how people justify killing and it's obviously going to be different for every person, different for every individual. So uh, first let's talk about murderers. That's my favorite a, topic. Yeah, I know. And in this case, it depends on the type of murderer and whether they feel sorry about what they did. Um, for example, a large percentage of serial killers are psychopaths and don't feel as much empathy for other humans as an average neurotypical person would. And it does still go back to the orbitofrontal cortex. Serial killers, psychopaths, and violent individuals have tended to have lower than normal activity in the orbitofrontal cortex. Brain function alone doesn't make you a serial killer. There's a lot of different factors, uh, like childhood. Uh, a lot of serial killers have a history of an abusive childhood, a traumatic childhood, stuff like that. So you can't just isolate it to brain function and measure people's brains and say, oh, you've got the serial killer brain. Uh, let's lock you up. This is very generally speaking. Um, so obviously I'm not a psychologist, but the, the few things that people point to that people see frequently when it comes to people who have committed murders, um, especially serial killers, is that they experience actually a physical head trauma when they were younger. So like there right. are, I, I can't think of specific cases right now, but along with that abusive childhood, there also will find that, oh, well, such and such fell from the staircase when he was two and a half and really banged his head. And this kind of brain trauma, you know, might have affected how his emotions developed. Not necessarily proven. I could probably do some research into it and see what kind of studies have been done on it. Yeah, and this is the complex thing about de defining traits of people who end up murdering or becoming serial killers, is that there's a distinction between causation and correlation. And oftentimes we can't tell the difference. As my statistics teacher in high school drilled into us a million times. Yes. Correlation does not prove causation. Right. Yay practically have that tattooed in my brain. Yes. So while we can say that people with head trauma or with uh, a certain function of the orbitofrontal cortex or with certain abuse in their childhoods might be more susceptible to becoming murderers, we can't say those are defining characteristics of murderers. We can't prove. You can't lock someone up based on their orbitofrontal cortex activity. We can't reduce people to our view of their brain function and their genetics because that is is uh, very dangerous. Uh, you can very quickly spiral into eugenics. And it's also ableist. I know a lot Indeed. of non-neurotypical, like autistic people will experience lower levels of empathy. That doesn't mean they'll become murderers. No one thing determines if you're going to kill people. And we don't know enough about the brain to make a solid judgment about anyone based on their brain alone. Serial killers, why they kill, it's a ton of different factors. But this is also entirely different than, you know, a serial killer versus what Katniss is about to go through. And I think you've touched on this a bit, but Katniss is experiencing killing not so much from the ser serial killer side, but more in the views of a soldier, right? Yes, and that's what I did research on next. So I found a BBC article from 2011 called How Soldiers Deal with the Job of Killing. Um, and basically there are several different ways that they deal with this. Uh, one is denial, like never saying the word kill, just saying they've like 
eliminated or neutralized a target, but never using the word kill. And then when asked if they've ever killed anyone in battle, saying no, when they probably have, and they know that they definitely have. Another is objecting. Actually, a large percentage of soldiers, especially newbies, will choose not to shoot when they're being told to shoot on the front line. And actually, that works into battle strategy. Like, if your soldiers are more willing to shoot the enemy than the enemy is willing to shoot you, you have a greater chance to, of winning. And a lot of their training focuses on how to actually pull the trigger when you're told to and eliminating that conscious or subconscious deciding not to pull the trigger in that moment. It's a real thing that happens on real battlefields. And it's it has happened since World War I, at least. So another way that they sort of deal with this is by rationalizing it. When ethically it becomes worse not to kill than to kill. And it doesn't necessarily become easier, it just becomes reasonable. And so that is how soldiers deal with the job of killing. As always, all these sources for the research will be linked in the episode notes below. Uh, I think this one is going to be more relevant to Katniss's journey in the arena and the decisions that she makes, um, especially rationalizing. She's going to have to make choices, and she realizes that in this section when she realizes that Pete is actually maybe a nice person. She knows it's eventually going to become worse for her not to kill him than it will to kill him. Which is why she starts to distance herself from him. Right. We see more of that deliberate distancing in the book than we do in the movie. In the movie, and I know this podcast isn't about comparing the movies and the and the books, but I just want to point it out for the sake of characterization. In the movie, Katniss is very cold. She's very serious. And she doesn't really, because we don't have her inner monologue as we do in the book, it's the kind of the same thing that happened with Twilight and Bella, where we just don't know what's going on in her head as much as we do when we're reading the book. So in the book, we see more of her human side, recognizing that nice people have a way of warming themselves into her life and that she has to make an effort to hold herself back with Peta. Whereas in the movie, she more appears to be immediately dismissive of him. And you can see that again on page 49 of the texts that we're reading. A kind Peta Melark is far more dangerous to me than an unkind one. Kind people have a way of working their way inside me and rooting there. And I can't let Peta do that, not where we are going. Going. going back to what you were saying, you know, it's going to be harder for her to kill him if he is kind to her. But then mm -hmm. she also notes that Peta hasn't accepted his death. This is page 58. She says, he, Peta, hasn't accepted his death. He's already fighting hard to stay alive, which also means that kind Peta Melark, the boy who gave me bread, is fighting hard to kill me. So we see that she does care very deeply and very much struggles with the idea of killing Peta. That warmth isn't necessarily felt in the movie, but we know we, we do see that demonstrated there. Also, book Peta throws down. Like, he is ready to, like, throw hands and is going to just be ready for anything. Movie Peter just kind mm -hmm. of looks a little frightened. He's kind of a flat character in the movie. He really is. But in this one, he he definitely jumps up a little bit more and is like, um, actually, I have things to say. And I think going back to comparing this with Twilight, we have a lot of the same problems with translating a first person narration to the screen, which is a visual medium especially with The Hunger Games, I think, because Katniss hides her emotions so often. So how do you act out her emotions visually if she never shows her emotions? And I think that's why she comes across very cold in the movies, is because she's not supposed to be displaying a lot of emotion. She's not supposed to look like an emotional character on the outside. She's also trying hard not to put herself out as a target. She's trying not to display emotion because she knows the weak one is the one that gets targeted first. She knows that as a right. hunter, and she also knows that as having watched The Hunger Games her entire life. Right, but how do you show that thought process going on? You can't, really. You don't, yeah. This is why we read books. Read books. A much better use of your time. Well, maybe not better, but certainly different. And I'm saying this as a person who loves books, like... <laughs> You can spend your time That's however true. way you want. I'm not going to tell you that you have to read books as opposed to watching movies. But I am. Just kidding. All right. Do you want to talk also, about Appalachia? Audiobooks are not cheating. 
I do want to talk about Appalachia. I'll try to summarize this a bit. But as we're leaving um, District 12, we're starting to see what the rest of Pan Am looks like. Because of that, I thought it would be good to kind of get an overview of where Katniss is coming from, just to see how her character has been shaped by her world. Uh, so I dove into the history of Appalachia. Uh, actually, my notes have several pages on it, so I'm going to do my best to summarize it. Uh, yeah, Jesus Christ. And most of this information came from Wikipedia, thank God. So if I'm directly quoting any kind of critiques or anything like that, most of that's going to be from the Wikipedia page that is going to be posted in the show notes as well. So if you want to look into a little bit more there, you can follow some of the hyperlinks that are on the Wikipedia page. According to Wikipedia, uh, Appalachia is a very poor region. There were lots of coal miners and lots of coal mining very early on. Uh, it stretches from the southern tier of New York uh, to mid-Ohio and Tennessee and just past West Virginia. And it tends to refer to the central and southern portions of it from the Blue Ridge Mountains. As of 2010, it was home to about 25 million people. That's absolutely going to be significantly less when it comes to the time of the Hunger Games. But they also have to deal a lot with enduring sensationalism about their lack of education and moonshining, uh, romanticizing their ruggedness and self-sufficiently, which really plays into the District 12 stereotypes. The region has faced a lot of what's called yellow journalism, which essentially stretches and makes satire or stereotypes, in this case within themes within Appalachia. So that would be the romanticizing their ruggedness and self-sufficiency the southernness, the, you know, the whole kind of backwoods different thought process, um, which is interesting because you definitely see that playing into the District 12 stereotypes because you see that, oh, you know, Effie thinks that District 12 is barbaric. And she even mentions when they are eating their food in the train, like, oh, the other two were just savages last year because they didn't, you know, they couldn't eat quietly. But, you know, turns out they were actually starving, which is why they couldn't eat quietly. And there's a clan dispute that took place in the region in the 19th century between the Hatfields and McCoys. I'm not going to go into as much detail as I wrote down about it because it's not super relevant, but essentially it is a famous clan dispute that really kind of shaped the overall narrative of that region. It was almost like the Southern Capulets versus the Montagues, where they were fighting each other and this big feud ended up really destroying much of their, both of their clans, actually. It comes forward as like, oh, it's another Hatfield and McCoys. And I've actually heard people describe confrontations and different problems as being like another Hatfield and McCoy. So that might be more of a common thing on my side of the world, but that's what I'm saying. Appalachia itself uh, does come from you know, a lot of coal mining it is very poor, especially within the 19th centuries and the and the 20th centuries. We, we just do hear a lot about it. In actually March of 1965, President Johnson signed the Appalachian Regional Development Act, which was solidifying the Appalachia's place as a galvanizing force in the nation's war on poverty. They were trying to expand the economic opportunities of the residents by increasing job opportunities, human capital and transportation. Because in the 1960s, one in three Appalachians lived in poverty. Per capita income was 23% lower than the U.S. average. Um, and high unemployment forced millions of people to seek work outside of the region. That same idea has stemmed back into District 12, where it is poor. There are people who are working hard for very little. And so I thought that was an interesting thing to, to pull up here, was that this um, Appalachian Regional Development Act was a ma major legislative achievement given the historic federal state partnership that envisioned it. And it did make a difference. It did significantly help to raise the capita, capital income and the, um, you know, workforce. But it just kind of gives you an idea of this was a very poor region early on in our nation's history. And then after the fall of our nation, it reverts back to yet another very poor region in District 12, which is completely different from the capital. And I know that you asked me, Lids, why the capital is in the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. And going back and editing episode one, I realized that we talked about that because we talked about NORAD, but uh, we have more details about NORAD this episode and actually how Suzanne Collins definitely did her research in creating this world. Oh, she definitely did. The big thing that we touched on the last episode was that the sea levels were rising and that's how most of the population 
population got wiped out. NORAD is a actual bunker within the Cheyenne Mountain. It was conceptualized during the Cold War and became active in 1967. And it is an actual military bunker that is within this mountainside. The mountain itself is about 9,200 feet above sea level. And then the average elevation of Colorado itself is about 6,000 feet above sea level. So safe to say, Colorado isn't bothered by a little rising sea levels. So NORAD is a top security military bunker that serves as a nuclear bomb shelter for the president and the most important government people. So, and I know that sounds like a conspiracy theory. Trust me, it's not. Look on YouTube. There are actually videos that you can see of people touring the NORAD facility um, that were just very recently released. So safe to say those who could save their skins were able to hustle on over to NORAD. And what's also interesting, we talk about, you see more of this further on in the books too, but the Capitol and District 2 are highly militarized. And I believe District 2 is very close to where the Capitol is, which is significant because if you look at Colorado, or at least this area surrounding NORAD now, we're in the middle of several military bases. Uh, we have Peterson Air Force Base. We have Fort Carson Army Base. We even have the Air Force Academy. So this is a very military-driven part of Colorado surrounding Cheyenne Mountain and NORAD. So it also, I think, adds to the strength of this is where the capital is because we are very militarized. There's a lot of force in and around my area. And then we have NORAD. So you could assume that that Collins definitely did her research and definitely picked a place that would make sense in terms of potentially building the capital. Not saying that it's directly in the area that Cheyenne Mountain is, but uh, certainly you can assume that it would be nearby. Yeah, I think it's reasonable to assume that if the government had to start over anywhere, they would start over there and make that the center, like that would become the center of operations. So I did a little bit of research about Suzanne Collins herself. And actually, she uh, was an Air Force brat growing up. She moved around. Uh, her dad was first in the Air Force and then a college history professor. And he was very open with his kids about his experiences in Vietnam and in war. Collins actually says, quote, I believe he felt a great responsibility and urgency about educating his children about war. He would take us frequently to places like battlefields and war monuments. It would start back with whatever had precipitated the war and moved up through the battlefield you are standing in and through that and after that. It was a very comprehensive tour guide experience. So throughout our lives, we basically heard about war, end quote. Wow. So she's she's no stranger to this stuff. She knows her no, stuff. Not at all. She definitely does. That's really cool. I wonder if her dad was ever stationed at Peterson Air Force Base. I don't know. Continuing on with the uh, history of Appalachia, there's a couple of interesting books, again, to look over. Again, as I mentioned before, in 1965, one in three Appalachians lived in poverty. But because of the act that I described previously that was set by President Johnson, uh, by 1990, the poverty rate had been cut in half. Um, so it did transform the region from one of the one of almost uniform poverty to one of contrast. So some have successfully diversified their economy. Some are still adjusting to structural changes um, and some are still severely distressed systems. I have only been to a few parts of that region. I drove from Colorado through Kansas and Missouri and part of Arkansas down to the very northern part of Mississippi. Uh, I live just outside of Memphis. So these are just words that I am reading from the overall Wikipedia summary page. And I don't have a lot of experience other than what I saw when I was living in Mississippi because I lived there for about three months. And it was still a very poor poverty-stricken place from the portions of Mississippi that I saw. But that being said, if I am making assumptions about this region and anyone feels the need to correct me, please do. Um, I'm not an expert on it. And if you are someone who has been in that region extensively or lives there and know and you know and I'm just completely talking bullshit let us know because I I really do want to portray that correctly but this is the this is the overall general view that 
has been given to the broader public who've never been in that portion of the country, which I thought was interesting and, and, and important to, to mention for the characterization of District 12 itself. There are also a couple of books that you can read that are set within that portion of the country. There's a Let Us Now Praise Famous Men um, is a book with text by American author James Agee. And there's photographs by American photographer Walker Evans. It was first published in 1941 in the United States, and it documents the lives of impoverished, impoverished tenant farmers during the Great Depression. It's interesting. It, it kind of takes a little bit look of the 1940s Great Depression era within that region. It has photographs about it. Another book that you can read is called Hillbilly Elegy. And I think this guy, the author of it, J.D. Vance, actually spoke at Pepperdine at one point. Um, yeah, I definitely during, did. Um, I didn't go see him, though. But Me neither. Uh, Hillbilly Elegy, which is called A Memoir of a Family and Culture in Crisis, uh, is, again, a memoir by J.D. Vance about the Appalachian values of his Kentucky family. And I'm directly reading the summary from Wikipedia in case anyone is curious. But it talks about the Appalachian values of his Kentucky family and the relation to the social problems in his hometown of Middleton, Ohio, um, where his parents moved when they were young. So, you know, as always, there's always going to be conflicting reviews of this stuff saying like, oh, this is white privilege. It's a different viewpoint, I think, that I'm probably used to because it's it's from a different part of the country that I've rarely experienced. So it's interesting if you feel like reading it. Also worth noting, I, I learned absolutely nothing about Appalachia in school. Neither did I. Did your fourth grade class have, because I remember in the fourth grade, our history for the entire year was just focusing on the history of Colorado. So like we only read and learned about the history of Colorado throughout the fourth grade. Did you ever have a, yeah, a we, year in grade school where you're just learning about California? Yeah, we had a yeah. California history year at the same time in every year. You could tell what time of year it was because the California mission projects were all being assigned. So all of the California mission craft projects would come to the forefront of Michael's because all the kids were building the m little models of the missions. And making California candles. History. I went to a mission in, I think I went when we were in the second grade, but I remember we made candles. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember there was always a field trip to Sutter's Fort in Sacramento where they had candle dipping and butter churning and a bunch of museum exhibits. Of course, all when we were in grade school, all of these exhibits were made out to be the most pristine version of American history as possible. Oh, of course. And didn't mention, you know, that the missions used Native Americans as slaves. But yeah, I think I went to Mission San Luis Rey, which is in Oceanside. And I think that's probably where they sent us. But it was it was neat. It was I remember loving it. And then we actually went to the oldest house in, in Los Angeles kind of reminded me of the same setup of those missions right. that I went to as a kid because mm -hmm. it was circular house with the courtyard, but along the same era time frame, which was really cool. I really loved that. Neat places, dark history. History is cool, but let's not read the sanitized version. Let's read about the actual yeah, stuff. Yeah, you got to learn the actual stuff. Mm -hmm. And eventually, if if you look for it and if you major in Hispanic studies, you do learn it. <laughs> like some people we know. All right, chapter four. Yeah, let's move on to chapter We've four. We've been recording um, for over an hour. <laughs> chapter four, PETA volunteers to take care of Hamish, who is drunk. And in this moment, Katniss resolves to have nothing to do with him. See previous about him being too nice. She also throws the cookies out of the train that the baker, Peta's father, gave to her and also sees dandelions, which reminds her, reminds her of the months when she figured out how to feed her family, gathering greens with Prim and hunting alone in the forest outside of the district. So this is all tying back into that moment when Peta essentially saved her life by giving her bread. And she's feeling a lot of mixed emotions about it. We also learned that she was named after an edible root, the Katniss root, and she thinks of home, doesn't cry, she goes to sleep. The next morning, Effie wakes her up for breakfast, and then Katniss and Peta confront Haymitch, which leads him to deciding to help him. Uh, he essentially recognizes that there's this fighting spirit in Peta and Katniss that he probably hasn't seen in a long time. And we see Peta knock a glass out of his hand and say, look, we're going to fucking fight and you're going to help us because that's what you're supposed to do. And then they enter the Capitol. Peta waves at people outside of the train, but Katniss shies away from them. So Katniss throwing away the cookies with the ellipses and the me memory that is triggered. I thought that was kind of awkward. Yeah. Um, just in general, if you 
find yourself using ellipses to like fade into the clouds into a flashback or something it's kind of bleh to me it's hard to weave in bits of emotional storytelling when you're in first person present so i get that but also it's a little bit awkward but it's the it's the first really awkward spot that i noticed in the book so far aside from the slightly clunky visits in the last chapter for reference it's on page 49 yeah i mean nina we're doing so much better than twilight like this is so much better no we actually sound educated now can you believe it yeah we can actually talk about the real shit and not just this is bad writing are you telling me that sparkly magical boners with no blood in them are not important lydia really I'm insulted. I'm saying that I don't have a lot to say about sparkling magical boners. I have a lot to say about poverty and mental health and, and killing plants. people. <laughs> and plants. And plants. And history. Damn it. All right. And history especially. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Ooh, this whole book is a ah. feast for me. It's my Hungry Games. I love history. Um, <laughs> I would love to, yeah, I mean, if I had all the money in the world, one of my degrees would definitely be a history degree. Didn't we talk about this? If we became vampires, we would just go back and get master's degree after master's degree. Oh my God. Oh my God. So many <laughs> master's degrees. I would have every, like, I would get a master's in, in political communications. I would get one in history. I would get one uh, in psychology. I would get one in criminal justice. I would probably get another bachelor's degree in biology and learn and go on and get a criminology degree as well and study genetics and DNA. Let's talk about how many master's degrees and and bachelor's degrees I would have if I had the time and the money. Oh boy, ah, I love school. Alas, alas, we have the internet. Someday. Also, yeah. a dandelion salad doesn't sound very good. I mean, it's edible, which I think is the point. Sure, I've never had one. I uh, can't remember eating a dandelion. I'm sure I have. Is a Katniss root a real thing? Yes, it's. Um, hang on, I looked this up. So the Katniss plant is actually a Sagittaria. So it's actually shaped like an arrow. And it's a Sagittarius. Named... It's a Sagittarius, which is me. Katniss is a Sagittarius. We need to read into yes. that. Who is the archer, which is my star <laughs> sign. Thank you very much. Katniss and I are bonded. Uh, but the, Sagittari the Sagittaria is a genus of about 30 species of aquatic plants, um, and they go by a variety of common names. Again, reading this straight from Wikipedia. <laughs> and that includes the, air the arrowhead, the duck potato, Katniss, uh, swamp potatoes. They're green and they're aquatic. Um, and most of them have arrow-shaped leaves, which is so symbolic because Katniss, of course, is her bow and arrow. So after all of that, I mean, there's really not much to say in Chapter 4, I think, because it is very action-driven and we start to see more of Haymitch. You know, he he becomes more of a central character. We have a lot of inner monologue, but it, it moves very quickly, this chapter does. You know, we could probably tear it apart a little bit more, but I think a lot of the heavy stuff that we wanted to cover really took place in chapter three, which is why we're kind of glossing mm -hmm. over chapter four. Not to say it's not important, but because it's so dialogue driven and because it is essentially the gateway into the rest of the book. Um, right. There's really not much to analyze here. You know, we're, we're literally entering the capital. Um, you know, we see the bright colors and the excited people who are welcoming the victors who are like, yay, they're going to kill some people. Woohoo. It's crazy. But this chapter is essentially the last step into the descent down into the capital, the last rung on the ladder before we jump down and the Hunger Games begins. Something that strikes me every time I watch the movie is that most of it takes place outside of the arena. I don't know if that's the same for the book, but like a full half of the movie was before. <laughs> I watched uh, Cinema Sins, Everything Wrong with the Hunker Games. I watched that this morning. Um, and they one of the sins was, it's been 46 minutes and we're just now starting the Hunger Games. Yep. So, yep. <laughs> you're right. Well, I think that just about covers it after nearly an hour and a half of recording. Yeah. Which geez. will be cut down for sure. But just know for us, we have been here all night. Do you have anything else to add before we close this out? Other than the fact that I cried while watching the movie again. I don't know how you thought you wouldn't normal. cry. I thought it wasn't going to get me, and then it did. Mm -hmm. I, I was mm -hmm. good. I was solidly good for a while, and then baby Amanda Steinberg died. And I was like, no! Steinberg, well, Steinberg. Well, I, I also watched The Hunger Games. Um, God, is it three weeks ago now? But I watched it with a friend of mine, 
we were downstairs in his basement and he has two huskies and one of them is this sausage shaped older husky and she is delightful and she's great i love her but she's also massive (laughs) and the entire time that we were watching the movie she was asleep on the floor next to us and let me tell you all the intense or romantic scenes were just made so much better and greatly emphasized by the fact that this husky snored throughout the entirety of this movie (laughs) any dramatic pauses any romantic moments any high intensity stuff that dog snored through all of it and wow oh man you know what also got me what the mutations i jumped (sighs) actually what got me was uh kato at the end when he goes all i all i know how to do is kill what's the point of it like at the end he really snapped which oh yeah i am so excited for the rest of this book I need to stop reading ahead, but like, oh, yeah. I'm so ready. I have so much to talk about and I don't even know what I'm going to talk about yet, but I know it's going to be a lot. Well, I think that pretty much sums up what we're doing now. Um, Based on the timeline of when we're recording, this is going to come out right around Halloween. Um, So just a quick reminder to stay safe. Don't burn the bread and uh, don't drive after the consumption of alcohol. Uh, you know, always use the buddy system. Let people know where you're going and make sure you all get home safe. So anyway, stay safe on Halloween, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any comments, feel free to talk to us on social media. We love that. We're on Twitter at Let's Unpack Pod. And you can rate, review, and subscribe through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Audio, and I believe SoundCloud. Did I get all of them? Yes. Woo! First try. Yeah. All right. Anyway, talk to us. Let us know if we missed anything. If you want us to cover something in particular, too. You know, all comments, suggestions, and questions are appreciated because that means someone out there is actually listening. Yay. Yeah. Let us do our research for you. (laughs) Absolutely. I was going to say have a good weekend. I don't know if you're listening to this on the weekend. It's the weekend for me. So have a nice rest of your weekend or whatever day of the week that you are currently experiencing. Let's get this bread. Let's get this bread. Bye-bye. Bye.